man. Stop it. Stop it. With very little complaint or even that much uh, attention from the outside, has done a vast amount of the work to make this conference happen. So thank you, Dan. My pleasure. <laughs> Go for it. Um, I hope you took in your fill of looking at beautiful things during uh, Stephen's talk because I do not have really pretty slides. Um, mine are really work a day because I'm talking about what's there before we start to design um, and what leads us to begin making decisions about things. Um, I want to preface a lot of what I'm saying by pointing out that I really, really believe in a very democratic approach to uh, tools and what people work with. I think that amateurs and professionals alike should have access to the most sophisticated, most versatile tools to do their work. Um, and I want to keep that clear of the idea of what is good or what is bad or what is appropriate, which is a very murky area. But uh, I do want to take a step back to be a little bit critical of what we use uh, and what how the tools that we use or that are made for us may influence the decisions come out of there to remind people to stay very conscious of the kinds of decisions they make and may need to make uh, to do the most appropriate work, which is what I think makes the best work. So um, I want to start talking about typefaces. Um, we've been, we are now a full generation deep into starting out with a couple of typefaces in a lot of the things that we do. And you know, one of the most basic things that you may do as a typographer is to decide on what you want to use, what you want your types to look, to look like. But what's there when you start thinking? Uh, we've been dealing f with, uh, for quite some time, with Times New Roman and Helvetica as sort of the go-tos that are the default, right? And there have been complaints about default typefaces in various contexts, and it's come up a bunch of times in this, con in this conference. But uh, if we take a step back and think about why there seems to be so much Helvetica and so much Times New Roman, and why they may seem like lazy choices, well, their ubiquity now comes from them being so popular for so long. Um, these typefaces became one of the first choices adapted to every platform, every medium, every method of text composition over the last hundred years or so. Well, it's not, I guess we're not at a full hundred with these two, but um, they were chosen because they were so successful. They were so successful not only because of what was considered the quality of their design, but also there was a push to get these out into the world right from the start. So uh, monotype and uh, Linotype um, had great muscle that they put behind the typefaces that they believed in, that they thought could be successful in the marketplace, and they advertised. And the Times being commissioned for a major respected newspaper gave it an immediate platform. So by the time that it was available to the public and adapted for other means of typesetting, you know, it had been shown in the best possible light. Um, Helvetica was a very successful. Um, and the thing is about the success of these typefaces reinforces their success as they go along. They kept becoming the first thing you would reach for in every circumstance. So when uh, Adobe had developed its PostScript page description language, um, they needed a set of typefaces to, to bake into this technical solution in 1984. A big part of the reason that they had to settle on some typefaces was it was assumed that the typefaces would be living in the output devices, not necessarily in the computers where people would work on things. So uh, as it has been told to me anecdotally, uh, Adobe and Apple hashed out a good core set of typefaces that were reasonably flexible for different kinds of work. So you had Times for booky things, Helvetica for headliney things. Um, Courier was a good choice for the code side of things, which is essentially the underlying typography of the code. There's still, if something went wrong uh, with a, a file that was described with uh, PostScript, something had to come out. And so they went with a monospace uh, font based on a typewriter that had been designed by IBM and made available without a copyright. Uh, Times New Roman, very popular. 
good solid that had a long history at this point of being used in newspapers and books. And Helvetica, which was also very, very popular, but also a big favorite of Steve Jobs, who really, really wanted that to be in there. So um, these typefaces had been around, and they were already very prominent, but this decision, this agreement between these two companies to make them defaults for what became sort of the standard for um, how print, printed material was sent out for output really baked these in and locked them in. And if you see the date, 1984, that was pretty early that that was set in motion. Well, uh, when Microsoft was uh, preparing Windows, so Windows had existed with a sort of a more basic interface, but when they started integrating typefaces into that whole experience, there had now been uh, years of these other successful type choices being baked into um, documents people had done of all kinds. They were written into the printers. Um, so Microsoft needed to respond to that, and you didn't want to wipe away all of these conventions that had already been, pl been put in place, further reinforcing the success and the dominance of these typefaces. Um, so they worked out a different set of typefaces, uh, and it kind of at that point required some parity with what was already available, with what people were working for. Um, and I think this led to what I always think of as sort of the great uh, tragedy of the aerial backstory, where a pretty good 19th century grot run through the mill of sort of a mid-century aesthetic got stretched and squeezed a little bit to match metrics that were built into the existing devices. Um, but this, this uh, kind of ecosystem of available fonts and being baked in early into our digital landscape set some things in motion. They were there to be the first choices. So whereas practice designers may be used to this idea of, all right, I can visualize something, I've sketched it out, I know what I want it to be, suddenly these sophisticated tools were in, in everyone's hands. They were retail products, they were widely available. So lots of people could use type in ways, so people could make flyers, newsletters, uh, prepare manuscripts, prepare books, and they had a few basic things to work with which start reinforcing this notion of, oh, this is what type is supposed to look like. I'm gonna make a choice, this is what's in front of me, I guess this is what things are supposed to be like. And it begins narrowing the space in people's assumptions about what things ought to look like. And it requires then slightly more effort to get to that space of making it look really different. So Microsoft Word uh, opens up with a page like this. And you can see in the screenshot I have here, they've already moved on to uh, Calibri as a default coming up. Microsoft has moved on over the years. Apple has moved on over the years. Other tools have moved on and made more fonts available. Um, but they still have to start with something when you open up a blank document. And the typeface that shows up in that space begins uh, people to assume this is what things are supposed to look like. I don't have to make any effort at this point except for what I want to say, and then suddenly these associations start getting baked in. Um, and these conventions take on a life of their own. Um, if, you, uh, if you look for things like uh, you know, term paper requirements, things that schools say, this is what your writing is supposed to look like, well, they had to make a decision about having an even playing field so that they could judge if papers were at the appropriate length, um, that they were not being, uh, you know, influenced unduly by the formatting of papers. Again, choices had to be made. So suddenly, in all of our schools, um, as people are being educated, they're told, this is what serious writing is supposed to look like. You have, you have to say what you have to say, but this is what we want to see. So again, reinforcing more of these associations, more of these patterns. Um, other industries fall into the same trap. Matthew Butterick has written quite a lot about the ubiquity of Times Roman in legal contracts, another sort of ubiquitous fact in our lives. Um, it's hard pushing back against these conventions once they're set in place. Um, designers, as I said, are trained to think about it and make other choices and try to lead people in other ways. But designers, when we design things for people, 
are designing things for people uh, that they would need to approve that may or may not look like what they have come to assume things are supposed to look like, or conventions that may have been written into requirements. Um, the, this idea of how the courier had been baked into PostScript is sort of the underpinning font uh, in the printer language um, has a similar, a similar dynamic to what happened with the World Wide Web. Uh, so this, is the, this page, which is still live at CERN, is the simplest HTML possible. Um, and it does things that we still value in text online. It is scalable, it is structured, it is actually pretty dynamic, but it makes no font specification. It just says we have some text, and a separate product, a web browser, has decided, all right, our default text is Times New Roman. Suddenly, Times New Roman becomes the underpinning of another whole medium, where if all else fails, this is what you see. And again, starts building some associations. Um, Microsoft uh, pushed back against this as well, saying it's like, well, we need to make more things available. They put together their uh, core fonts for the web so that there were a greater range of choices and tones available. Um, and for any of you who have ever worked on websites, or more broadly, people who've looked at websites up until, the, uh, say, the last few years or so, this became the palette, still quite narrow, still trying to achieve a reasonable range of options, um, but it became maddening in many situations to work with these typefaces. They didn't want to do everything that a designer would need to do. Um, and where I actually credit a lot of the people who were involved in the web um, for, for sort of the first chunk of the life of the web, uh, many designers and developers became very good at microtypography because working with a limited palette of reliable typefaces, they had to think more about uh, structuring their information, thinking about how the small decisions could make big overall effects. Um, in the more professional end of the tools, which again are still available to a wide range of people, you have this setup of what do you want to do? Um, what are you going to do first? So in uh, Quark Express, which I worked on for many, many, many years, 12-point Helvetica was it. And pardon the German version, but Indra is the only person I know well who I could get screenshots from for uh, Quark Express. Um, Adobe InDesign followed a similar model. Uh, when it was launched, it was, it was building off of this sort of workspace that Quark Express had established in the industry. Um, now, so Minion Pro, a typeface developed by Adobe, is the default in InDesign, but that even came slightly later. In a way, this is a more tactical decision to create a more distinct personality for working in the InDesign space. But um, uh, David Lemon at Adobe shared this with me. This is the built-in font stack for the first version of InDesign. You see a lot of those basic default fonts coming up as what's there when you would open up a document and say, what do you want to do? And I think, you know, that underlying foundation of the most basic options possible, while making it, you know, a great way for people to start working, can be counterproductive. And I think every tool over the years has responded to this by making more things available. I actually think that for a casual user of these sophisticated tools, uh, a wider and ever wider array of typefaces and document templates are probably good um, because they move people away from this assumption that things are only supposed to look one way. Um, but there's this problem that it's not just about the typefaces and the typesetting that are defaults that influence how people can think things are supposed to look like. For a very lazy designer, for a casual user, you get shepherded into one direction. And if you don't make that effort to move past it, if you don't have the knowledge or the energy or the time, um, certain things are put before you that define the outcome. And I think what is a trickier subject is actually the handling of the document space. Um, so the, you open up a default and it is a letter or an A4 sheet, um, and it's assumed this is what things are. This is has been reinforced by other 
industry decisions about just the standardization of paper sizes, uh, manufacturing and what's made available. So of course, there would be defaults because the paper goes into the printers, you make a document to fit the printer, so it comes out. But even still, that masks over the fact that there are these two standards. There are other stan paper sizes that are available. Um, so it makes it easy to move away from thinking about what size sheet do I need and how do I want to compose onto that sheet because other decisions have already been made because of other people's um, commercial priorities. The tricky thing about that model of starting with that blank page in the electronic space is it leads you to a place where you're composing from the edge inside to the page, essentially creating a bucket that you pour text into that then requires work to do something else. And this is a more recent development, and I think that that's the tricky bit, because if you think about type and type composition before that, it started with the galley of text. It started with the decision, how wide does this need to be? How much type am I going to fit in there, and what size should that be? And the effort into the planning was kind of kept the idea of the eventual printing and the sheet in the background, but the decision making was there with the type and with the text. And then that could be put against the paper and placed in different ways. So there, were even, there was even still room to adapt in the relationship of these. Um, now, I worked in uh, electronic typesetting systems before the advent of desktop publishing, where you worked in this way, this kind of model of starting with the text, the measure, of that being the question what you want to do, um, came through from metal composition to photo typesetting to these early digital methods, where you began with a measure and a typeface, and you would structure the internal relationships of the text, why they're pulling things out, setting headlines, worrying about the microtypography, and then planning the arrangement of the page around it, but keeping the focus on those internal structures, and then making conscious decisions about how that material related to what was around it. Um, now, so we've been all been participating in discussions over the years about what do you do when what you're designing for isn't for a book or a page or a poster. The electronic space has only given us more and more variables to consider, um, different proportions, different arrangements, different media. Um, and I think that there's a moment here of getting back to some more solid thinking about what is typography and what is composition and what is structure of the text. When there are so many more variables about the space that are things in, and we can quickly see that one set of decisions fails in so many more instances if it's not considered more carefully, the idea of the space becoming less of an issue than the text um, can get us back out of these uh, assumptions that you can only have a couple of typefaces, your page is a bucket, and things go into it. Um, the rise of web fonts is assisting this, so people can finally move past that palette of the uh, safe web fonts. And more and more and more, people are, are doing that, and they are relishing this variety and all the playfulness. So regardless of you know, how well people make a lot of these decisions, I think it's fantastic that responsive design has made it easier for people to think um, more and more carefully about what are appropriate decisions for the context, for the space around it. Um, now, you can do all these things and plan a responsive site so that it adapts as you stretch out a window, but the reality is um, what underpins this idea of a design being responsive is that people aren't going to necessarily see it in all these instances. They'll see one, and that one has to work. That one has to make the impression. And it has to work as well as it might when someone sees something in yet another space. Um, to get this right, knowing that the measure may change, the scale may change, typefaces may shift um, in response to the circumstance. So we get back to this notion of what is the internal structure and what are those relationships between the pieces and the structure which are most critical. Um, the sanctity of the text uh, becomes more prominent, which gets us back into what typography is presumably about, which is, creating structure and presentation so that people can be led to read something and take in an idea, take in a message. Um, and 
to get all of these things for all of these contexts to feel like they may belong, even if the content may move around, you have to think more about what's in the middle, what's in the inside, rather than what's framing it. What is your paragraph and your headline, uh, your parallel piece of text, any side information? Um, and to me, this is potential moment to go back to all of our tools, not just for uh, designing for digital spaces and for the web, but to push for more options back into designing for print. Um, can we move past this model of the page being a bucket that all the text goes into and concentrate more on the structure of that text and how it can adopt? There are tools out there that do this, and they have been there all along. They've mostly been used for enormous batch publishing projects where a small team of people need to do hundreds of things. Um, I worked for a technical publisher where I wrote type specs um, for a line of 600 books that would be produced semi-automatically. Editors would tag the text. Um, they would be run through patterns of typesetting specifications that I prepared with rules for how they get paginated as things moved around, and books would spit out the other side. Um, tools that do this never became broadly available because they were very expensive and very demanding in terms of computing power. Demands of computing power are not much of an issue in the world of typography anymore, so I think there is a moment where we may get tools for print design now, not where you can do great and sophisticated work, but you're encouraged to do more sophisticated and more thoughtful work, the same way that all the developments of CSS and um, um, you know, uh, detecting the environment that text appears in are leading us past a simplistic approach to design for, design for the digital space. Um, and I would like to see that happen because I really care about the sanctity of the message and the text and what we have to do. That's, that's really important to me as a typographer that I'm supporting what someone else has to say, whether it's personal work or commercial work. And we clearly have the technical uh, sophistication to come up with better tools, and this is an important moment to think about, well, what other kind of tools can we have to help us get to these better places more easily? So thank you for that.